Welcome to Future Library. Uh, again, I'm back uh, recording and, and talking into your ears, listeners. Uh, a week ago, I was sitting in my room uh, reading The Wire. Uh, and Well, when I say I was reading The Wire, I was reading an email from The Wire. And the email directed me to a page about some unreleased music by a chap called Laraji. And I thought, this looks interesting, so I clicked on it. And I listened to all the tracks on the page, and I thought, this is really good. So I then went to Spotify, and I listened to more tracks on Spotify. Then I went and read the article that was in The Wire. And then I kind of thought, you know what? I think I should speak to this guy, as he seems really interesting. So due to the wonders of the internet, uh, less than a week after discovering him, I present you with Laraji. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Alex, and it's good to hear from you in uh, this transatlantic Skype phone call. Uh, Skype is a wonderful thing. I am, I'm a huge fan of Skype. Uh, it allows people across the world to speak to each other for virtually no money at all. It's fantastic. You've got to love it. Yeah, but, yeah I agree. Uh, before I go any further, though, am I pronouncing your name correctly? That's that's very good. And it's an interactive name, but La Raji or La Raji works uh, wonderful. Okay, excellent. So, well, for listeners who, like me, a week ago, uh, weren't particularly aware of who you were, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Wow, a little bit. <laughs> How uh, much you like? <laughs> <laughs> well, the body was born in Philadelphia in 1943, and uh, to two beautiful parents. My mother was a church-going uh, seamstress nurse, and my father was a tailor. He was, had did, a, did some army uh, time, and they moved up from Philadelphia to Perth Amboy, New Jersey, and that's where I went to school and was into Baptist church, and my mother was very open to me exploring music, so in the school system, the school system at Perth Amboy, New Jersey was very open for uh, encouraging students to explore music, a musical instrument. So I started out once in a church, singing in the choir, then school, playing violin, piano, trombone, singing in the choirs and in the bands and the orchestras and singing in the church choirs. So music was a very, very deep and strong uh, element in my uh, formative years. Uh, let's see, somewhere in, in high school, um, I had gotten the notion that I wanted to be a chemical engineer or an architect. So I was preparing for a rather serious engineering career all the time with music in the background. And at one point in high school, uh, I got um, the revelation that music was really my my passion. So I switched my entire focus from engineering to music and I went on to get a scholarship and go to Howard University for theory and composition and piano as a major. So I pursued my dream to be a music composer. And in college, I uh, at Howard University in Washington, D.C., I uh, practiced piano, studied music theory and composition, pledged to fraternity, did a lot of partying, <laughs> and did comedy on the side. And the comedy got to be so good that uh, I was inspired to come to New York after four years of college and explore comedy as a possible way to get some income to set myself up so I could uh, have a piano in my apartment and start composing again. But the um, the comedy led to movies and off-Broadway and touring, and it got me into a position of really questioning my inner center. Uh, before going any further into the mass media. So at that point, I began uh, exploring meditation and world philosophies to get a stronger sense of just exactly what I wanted to do with my energies in the mass media. And exploring these uh, spiritual disciplines opened up my creativity, uh, my improvisational creativity so wide that suddenly I went back into music again and this time uh, exploring an electronic auto harp uh, after having a meditative experience of hearing divine sound current and being inspired to use music for, for consciousness purpose, for the sake of uplifting consciousness and opening consciousness. That was around the early 70s. Uh, by that time, I was married, and uh, we gave birth to a daughter, and all of that experience 
helped me to uh, sense that gene. I wanted to do something on a global level to um, head off this nuclear threat to our planet. Mm -hmm. After when uh, giving birth to a child made me aware of a sense of obligation to the next seven generations on this planet, how to keep this planet healthy and habitable for the next seven generations. So that opened up my music called direction toward using it for more humanitarian healing and uh, mood uplifting functions on the planet. Uh, the electronic, the zither, or the auto harp, which uh, was an exploratory instrument for me, it was lighter than a piano, and I could alter the tuning, and I could electrify it, and I could play out on the sidewalks of New York uh, and earn money at it, and at the same time send out good vibes to sort of one man working to shift the energies on the planet. And that was in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and then into Manhattan around the uh, early 70s, in the, no, the mid-70s to late 70s. And somewhere along the way, uh, I met up with the Brian Eno while I was playing in Washington Square Park one evening. And he uh, invited me to participate in an ambient music recording project he was launching at that time. Uh, an album that resulted from that meeting was called Day of Radiance Ambient Number no. 3. And that set me on the uh, global theater. Uh, mm -hmm. Music was being heard globally at that time. It took me about five years to really catch up to traveling to catch around the world behind that recording. But during that time, I was still exploring uh, meditation, Tai Chi, different spiritual modalities to get clearer and deeper about my sense of purpose. And uh, uh, that that resulted in a deeper form of music that attracted me into playing for expos, meditation centers, healing groups, uh, and alternative music festivals and concerts. Uh, along the way, I recorded, my early recordings were on cassette tapes, and that uh, Brian Eno's and allowed me to move into albums, vinyl, along with another album at that time called Celestial Vibration. So those were my two first albums in the late 1970s after recording mostly on cassette tapes. And into 1980s, playing for a lot of New Age conferences, expos, and meditation centers, I uh, began recording more vinyl and eventually into CDs, compact CDs in the late 80s, expanding my audience and expanding my collaboration with other artists, not just musicians, but uh, dancers, guided meditation people, and uh, some film projects. And into the 90s, by that time I was working with a group that Brian had put together called Opal Evening. It was touring throughout Europe and Japan and some United States. It was composed of mostly solo performer composers who were releasing their works on Brian's label, Opal Evening, Opal Limited at that time out of the out of Britain. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, project went like uh, we traveled and each of the... Um, artists would do their solo work during the concert and we'd all come together at the end and do collaboration, uh, spontaneous collaboration. And out of those spontaneous collaborations came some music that was further released in uh, separate albums. One of them was uh, Flow Goes the Universe. Uh, along the way, Opal kind of softened and All Saint Records took over. And for the last five or six years, All Saints was has been kind of quiet, so I haven't released any major releases until just this October when All Saints, in collaboration with Warp Records out of England, decided to release three albums, one a retrospective and two other are re-releases. Uh, and this was parallel, uh, an album release that came out of uh, California by a record company called Light in the Attic, which released an anthology of New Age musicians from the 70s and 80s, on which I am uh, included. 
So that's four albums that came out simultaneously in October. And here I am, when it rains, it pours, talking to Alex. <laughs> it, it seems that, because it, it seems from what I'm, I'm reading that there's been this, <clears throat> as you say, this sudden kind of explosion in interest again. Like, it's like a whole, a new generation has come to your, your work and has become aware of it. I mean, you, there's, uh, I understand there's a remix record coming as well. Is that correct? Uh, when you say the remix, which one are the, the, the two, there are two out that are, are a remix. All right. Cause yes. the, the one I'm thinking of is the one that, uh, it was listed on the, the little kind of, uh, page on the wire that had people like Motion Sickness of Time Travel and, uh, Bee Mask on it, uh, talking about uh, the things like A Cave in England and uh, oh, yes. Space Choir being remixed. Yes, that one is Flow Goes the Universe, that's a remix, and Audio Active, The Way In Is The Way Out. Those two albums are included in a double album, ah. and they're, they're called The Two Sides of Laraji is the name of that album. Fantastic. It includes those remixes. Well, I think it's interesting that these guys are, are remixing your work, because uh, when I first started listening to it a week ago... Uh, it struck me as how kind of current it sounds, and I've not found anything that I've listened to from from you that sounds remotely dated. I think the music you're doing, and or have been doing for for all these years, seems to me to have this kind of timeless quality that uh, has kind of. Yes. There's, it seems to me that a lot of things that are going on in the in the U.S. underground at the moment are starting to kind of align with what you've been doing for a long time. Uh, so there's a lot of young guys out there and young, young men and women making music that's kind of similar to the way you've worked for a long time with with your kind of setup with the with the zithers and uh, the synths and all the various things that you've got in there. Uh, so I mean, did you, did you find that your music just came to you as it was, or did you work at it, or was it just a kind of fully formed thing that popped into your head? Uh, well, Alex, what what started it, I guess, was having a full-blown divine hearing experience in the 70s, mm -hmm. which I could say sounded like a, a cosmic orchestra of brass instruments weaving this timeless uh, concophony that had no ending or beginning, and it seemed to be the soundtrack of the infinite universe having its cosmic reunion and during that experience i had an emotional experience i could say close as i could say is that my heart cracked open falling in love with the universe on a deeper level and uh, what came out of that was a desire to emulate that experience or to share it or to do something with it i couldn't record it and i can't actually play that music but it inspired the music i do and it drives the music that I do now and I guess what I got out of that experience is a sense of timeless a timeless quality that you mentioned that somehow I've been able to let it flow through the music that I do do uh, along the way I've experimented with different effects for the zither different tunings different ways of playing the zither on a harp and so it the vocabulary for the instrument just slowly evolved through trial and error hit or miss sort of like cooking with ingredients you never you weren't familiar with mm -hmm. till you taste them and what evolved is um, a vocabulary of using electronic uh, treatments and uh, different techniques of getting sounds from the instruments along with other things like voices and kalimbas and synthesizers so it grew uh, step by step um, the only a sound that I heard that inspired me in this direction was that inner sound experience, which drew, drove me emotionally mm -hmm. to seek out a compliment on this side of the veil, as it were. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting. I think, so it seems that, uh, how can I word it? It seems that there's this, I have to say the timelessness of it uh, really kind of speaks to me. Uh, 
I, I'm kind of feeling a little bit bad because my zither's sitting upstairs. Uh, I've oh, never, you have a zither too. Uh, I do, I, and it has a pickup stuck to the underside of it as well. Oh, and we have to get together, Alex. <laughs> well, the next time you're in the UK, for sure, definitely. <laughs> um, you see, I've got I've got a zither with a little uh, contact mic stuck to like gaffer taped to the underneath, and I've yes. got a thumb piano with the same thing. Um, wow. You know, so I've got I've kind of I think that's the other thing that kind of reached out to me from your music was that a lot of the things that you use are things that I've been playing around with for the last few years and using as sources for for kind of what I tend to do is I play little bits and then sample them into my laptop and then do things with them afterwards <clears throat> excuse me um, and I think that kind of I think that kind of reached out to me as well and I think what really kind of blew me away was some of the uh, kind of quite early things like things from the well you know things that from my point of view would be early like 1987 and stuff seemed very very much like uh almost sounded like modern electronica and mm -hmm. and it seems that there's this kind of creating this sound that sounds almost like it's been put together on a computer but which has clearly not been it's been clearly done you know manually and uh you know, with a great deal of uh, love and time put into it. And I think that's a fantastic thing. I think that's also partly what's maybe talking to this new generation of people who are starting to discover you music. Uh, I think it was interesting what you said about uh, <clears throat> having a child kind of focusing the mind about the future. I found exactly the same when I had my two sons. Uh, it, it does have the effect of stopping you just thinking about your immediate lifespan, doesn't it? Yes. You could go, ah, oh, well, you know, I'm going to be gone one day, but my child isn't. And then when grandchildren come along, you're like, oh, they're still going to be around. And then, you know, and it, it, I find it's really kind of tied me into a feeling of continuation into the future. But, yes. but it's also made me appreciate the past that I've come from, you know, and, in the, the, that it's this unbroken kind of chain of existence of individuals, but the same kind of genetic information going forward and backwards in a huge direction. But I don't know where I'm going with that. What so. you just said, what you just said, allowed me to connect a little deeper to your title of Future Library. Well, that's it. Yeah, the title of it is that the idea of the the podcast was that I, I want it to be something that people can look back on. At mm -hmm. some point, because I, I think part of, uh, from my point of view, part of becoming kind of aware of mortality is feeling that I want to leave behind a body of work. And, yes. you know, I've got a lot of music out there, but I kind of feel that there's, if people want to know a bit about me, they need to hear me talking. And <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, that's, that's why I called it Future Library, because I see it as at some point it's going to be finished. And it'll be something I'll look back on and go, oh, you know, I did some good work there. Oh. Yes, yeah. uh, I have a sort of similar feeling that I think of the work as I'm doing will be music that I'll enjoy listening to in my very senior, senior years. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Serene, relaxed, uh, easy on the breath and allowing me to just be in contemplation or be in my gentle years gently well that's another thing i noticed about your music was that it, you seem to have this talent for making music that can be as uh, uh you can involve yourself as much as you like in it or you can really step back from it so i can sit and listen to it and find myself very kind of engrossed in the textures and what's going on and be very conscious of it or i can put it on quite quietly and listen to it while i'm falling asleep and it seems to serve both purposes uh and I think it was quite interesting what you were saying about doing the performances for kind of uh, alternative shows in the States, but also doing shows at kind of expos and yoga classes and things. I think that's a kind of a unique situation that you're in, that you've got your foot in kind of these two completely different worlds. Yeah, uh, and, and they, they help to feed both worlds too. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and I do concerts with, say, electronic uh, or alternative uh, music uh, concerts, traveling with other artists, I become familiar with a technology um, that I can explore and experiment with, and I can take that back to my meditation yoga classes, play four, and give them a unique sound. And then out of my meditation yoga new age conferences, I 
I get deeper into understanding and consciousness, which I can take and put into my more uh, electronic uh, uh, mainstream concert uh, performances. So I can bring a meditative, gentle healing quality to my more world concert kind of audiences. Mm -hmm. And I can bring more of a world technology, explore technology, to uh, um, meditative yoga, New Age conference kind of uh, setting. So that's so I've fantastic. Found that a unique, um, what they call symbiotic or exchange. Yeah, well, I, I just realised that describing you as having one foot in each in each of them seems to be slightly inappropriate. I think it's actually fairer to say you've got both feet in both. Well, I think thank s- you. simultaneously you've managed to kind of overlap these two things completely, and you kind of stand comfortably in both of them. Because I think the phrase, you know, having one foot in two, you know, one foot in one camp, one foot in the other, has a slightly kind of negative connotation, and I, and I don't want this to have that because. I don't think there's that going on. I think you've you've obviously got a mastery of both sides of it and a complete understanding of both sides of it. And as you say, you're pulling elements from one into the other and allowing them to kind of cross-pollinate. Yes, that is well said. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a really good thing because you're exposing people who are going to the retreats uh, – and, and the, the classes and things, you're exposing them to maybe music that they wouldn't hear otherwise. Yeah. And you're pulling in elements that you're kind of learning from the kind of more, as you put it, the more kind of mainstream concert side of things. And then at the other side, you're pulling your experiences from the meditative side into the concerts. And I think it benefits both sides, and I think that's a really positive thing to do. So I think thumbs up on that one, definitely. Uh, I understand as well you do laughter uh, courses. Yes, lots more and more. It's like a double career or they both complement each other. This, uh, well, laughter has been a strong element in my expression ever since grade school. I'm finding one way or another to get people into the laughter zone. It was a way of self-preservation as I grew up in a pretty tough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And throughout high school and college, I got involved with comedy programs, writing comedy, being in comedy teams. Uh, Coming to New York in the late 60s, I explored comedy as a way of um, making money and uh, stand-up comedy doing off-Broadway and some film work. One of the films was called Putney Swope. I Mm -hmm. did some television commercials. And uh, eventually it... uh, I got into the uh, the consciousness side of things, and what I gathered from the consciousness side of things is that my the comedy I was doing was polarizing. It was getting people to laugh by polarizing people, mm-hmm. and I rethought, did I really want to continue doing that? And so I softened my approach to comedy for a while, but that time music took off and started becoming the main center of my life. And somewhere around the, uh, when I got into the conference circuit in the early 80s with my music, uh, someone made me aware of laughter as being a form of meditation. And I explored it. It was a suggestion of Rajneesh, Bhagwan Rajneesh, who's now called Osho, who promoted laughter as a form of meditation. And when I was exposed to that, attitude it opened up my uh my my attitude of using laughter as a form of meditation and then developing a workshop around it and so that pulled me back into working working with laughter but with different hours and different groups and a different format now I'm working with laughter as a way of getting into meditation and a way of opening up our um ourselves to the health benefits of conscious laughter. Mm-hmm. It's less about telling jokes, it's less about laughing at something, and it's more about using our ability to instigate laughter and direct the force, the physical vibration of our laughter into different energy centers in our body. 
but along the journey of these play shops, warm human act- interaction occurs and warm, spontaneous laughter erupts alongside of the stage intentional laughter. Mm-hmm. You see, I think that's one of the things, isn't it, that with laughter that uh, you can start it off with, as you say, the kind of the the forced laughter, and then it does start to generate... People hear other people laughing, and it sort of sets them off. And I think... Uh, yeah. I think, which is probably the reason why they always used to have the kind of laughter tracks on uh, sitcoms back in the day. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a cue in one way to say you are allowed to laugh at this part. But I think it's also to kind of get the get the subconscious into a place where it can accept that laughing is okay. Uh, yes, those laughters, as I remember, Alex, were polite laughter. Mm-hmm. They they weren't the kind of laughter that my friends. <laughs> 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 we would crack up. Yeah. And uh, I never heard any of those can laughter really include the cracking up kind of laughter. Mm-hmm. But they were polite laughter. Well, I think the kind of, to my mind, the, the, the laughter that I enjoy the most is where I'm laughing so hard that I've got tears rolling down my face. I think that's, you know, when you're kind of gasping for breath and you're laughing so hard and you can feel you're, you're laughing with your whole body. Uh, that's, that's the kind of laughter that I enjoy the most, I think. Uh, that is... Uh, I'm uh, kind of uplifted to hear you say that because uh, there's been a slight uh, a slight image of that uh, British people don't get into laughter that deeply. Ah, uh, you see me. And, uh, and well, well, at least I don't see it, <laughs> and and I don't see it on a large scale. That it, there's a reservedness. Laughter is more of a reserved experience. But I'm willing to. Un- unlearn that attitude well i think it's something that we i think there's a part of it that we kind of present to the rest of the world is this attitude that the nation is very kind of you know reserved and, and controlled i mean my wife's american and she's been surprised at how all the things she thought about the uk uh and about the british have turned out to slowly not be true but they kind of were only true to her in the first place because the British had allowed that image to kind of persist. (laughs) You see Uh what I mean? Um, I think, uh, I mean, obviously I can only speak from my own kind of subjective experience of it, but I think the, I think British comedy is certainly very, uh, it allows itself to laugh at itself. Uh, Obviously kind of sarcasm, something that we're very big on in the UK. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think there's a certain sort of, self-awareness when we're laughing and certainly when i've been to see stand-up comedians audiences are more than happy to really kind of let go and laugh very very hard let um, go and laugh yeah i think and i think that's a great thing i think the more people laugh because it, it is it's i kind of wonder if it's almost has the same effect on human beings as purring does on cats hmm you know the soothing yeah releasing cathartic mm-hmm uh, transforming stuck, block, rigid places into fluid, open, soft, reduces armor, mm-hmm. rigidity, and it takes us into our vulnerability, that uh, emotional openness. Yeah, because you're absolutely right. Because I mean, it is a very kind of emotional uh, display, almost. Uh, it's a, it's an outward display of emotion. And I think certainly in, in the world that we live in today, that kind of thing is maybe frowned upon a little bit that, you know, especially in, in the current kind of global climate, that things are seen as being very serious and uh, mm. difficult. And I think it's I always it always makes me happy when I see pictures of people smiling or laughing, even in difficult situations, because I think that. Yeah, yeah that gives me a feeling of hope about the future of our species. You know, I think I think it's that attitude that's going to allow us to kind of keep going and to uh, get beyond where we are now. And it's going to be that kind of attitude that's going to get us that properly out into space. And, I do agree. You know, and I think that's important. I think it's really important that we we try and push forward as much as we can, because yes, that um, in pushing forward, I think of laughter or laughter work, even comedy is uh, energy work. It's mm-hmm. moving energy. It's uh, suggesting the mo- movement of energy in spite of what the outer picture, the outer environment is suggesting for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether the outer suggestion is 
to be in fear or to be in doubt or to be in uh, paranoia, that laughter, and even smiling, can suggest an openness and a flowing and a movement of energy. Mm-hmm. It, it, it encourages people to to share experience and to uh, empathize with each other. And I think that's hugely valuable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's the same with music as well. It, that's got the same kind of... So I can see where you're coming from with the two things kind of uh, complementing each other. They, It seems to me that both uh, strands of what you're doing there are about bringing people together in a, a kind of in a, an environment where they can allow themselves to uh, express kind of maybe a vulnerability to themselves or allow themselves to be vulnerable in a situation where that vulnerability won't then be uh, taken advantage of. Yes. Uh, it, it, I do a state at the beginning of the workshops that the shortest distance between two people is laughter. And I make sure that before we get into the heart of this play shop that we are all connecting to the inner child by Mm -hmm. getting into the play zone and that playfulness and having the inner child out makes us less rigid about connecting with one another and sharing openly and entering a a community a spontaneous community of warmth and trust Mm -hmm. i think that's i think again i i think it's the way forward for us as a species i think we've got to re-embrace that uh, sense of community and to allow ourselves to accept kind of local communities and the benefits that those local communities have on a global scale if everybody's in local communities mm. you know does that make sense does that sound yes yeah uh and at the same time to say that there is something called reservations or inappropriate laughter for mm-hmm. instance would you expect the uh, the prime minister to make a, a speech on television, but open up with cracking up for for, for one minute? <laughs> 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 no. And also, I understand that in the school systems here, when a teacher is not going to be in, and a substitute teacher must take their place for a few days, I understand that the substitute teacher is advised not to laugh with the students but to establish a sense of authority for the mm-hmm. first day or so. That laughter can uh, challenge uh, a sense of authority. Mm-hmm. And so there's a thing where it would be great to think of everyone laughing and smiling all the time. Uh, and But in cases where you need to think of authority or uh, on hierarchy, for instance, I know that uh, employers will laugh among themselves in a way that they won't laugh amongst their employees. Mm-hmm. Employees will laugh amongst themselves in a way that they won't laugh in front of their employer. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think it would be slightly inappropriate uh, if, say, you know, President Obama appeared on television to announce some catastrophe uh, and opened it by having a bit of a chuckle at the start. I think it would send the wrong message. Uh, it would. It would send the wrong message outwardly, but it could send a good message inwardly. Yes. Um, but then you know, you're, if you're a president, it means you've got your, your wits about you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one would hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, well, I mean, our, our politicians in the UK have to get quite used to being laughed at. Uh, and being challenged kind of publicly. Uh, certainly the way a lot of our television interviewers deal with them, uh, they show a lot less respect than I think American politicians get. That's one of the things that really surprised my wife when she came here. Was well, in, in, in Great Britain, you think you get less respect than, than in the US? I think, well, I think politicians do. Well, I think, oh. well, I think they, get, they still get a certain amount of respect, but I think they're treated as being just other human beings who are doing a job that have been voted in by the people and okay. they are answerable to us. Uh, oh. You know, and I think that's a healthy thing as well. Uh, yes. You know, I think that kind of sense of... I, I think it's one of the things I like about the British is there's, there's that sense of uh, respect is earned rather than automatically bestowed just because of a title. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you'll see, like, the Prime Minister uh, will be on something like the TV show Newsnight... Uh, with the interviewer Jeremy Paxman and uh, Paxman will just really go at him and he won't give him an inch 
and he won't kind of be like, oh, well, thank you for coming on. He'll be like, you know, well, you've lied to the House, haven't you? You've done this, you've done that. What do you have to say to it, Prime Minister? And I think that can be quite healthy as well. So I think the kind of, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to work out how a kind of combination of various things would work. How do we make this kind of perfect society where you have the the openness that laughter can bring uh, the appropriate time for laughter. I don't know. It's a it's a bigger problem than I can I can figure out in a in a podcast. Well, uh, as you, you go into that area of the ideal mm -hmm. perfect society, if, uh, um, where laughter is more available and more pronounced. Well, if you look at children, why if if we had a society of just children. Well, <laughs> and our children would freak out if there was no one there to take them, take care of them. <laughs> but let's say the children were laughing and playing all the time and didn't have that perspective of six months ahead or seven months mm -hmm. ahead, that they were more in present time and they had a sense that their uh, major responsibilities were being taken care of by someone else. They, they were free and able to be in lightness and in spontaneity mm -hmm. and the spontaneous they were free to spontaneously explore sensations that came up that uh, as opposed to being fearful or being in doubt or being in paranoia. Mm -hmm. So when you think of uh, a perfect society or a perfect world where that kind of lightness would prevail, it, uh, as, as I'm talking, I think uh, a far out image would be let's say, metaterrestrials coming in and taking over the planet and being our stewards and our guardians, and suddenly we're released from all responsibilities and we can be in the play zone. Mm -hmm. but I'm trying to think of what kind of situation would a planet of adults uh, be that they were freed up to not have to be concerned about the next 10 days and next three years or five-year plan and that uh, the major responsibilities were taken care of, and they were free to play and explore all sensations. Probably a planet of artists could be like that. Well, it's interesting that you're saying that, because uh, I don't know if you've uh, ever been aware of the uh, Scottish author uh, Ian M. Banks, uh, no. but he, he wrote a, a... I mean, unfortunately, he died this year uh, quite young. He was in his 50s, and he, he developed cancer and died, which is a great loss, because he was a fantastic writer. But in his science fiction books, uh, he's written a, a, a society that's very much like that. The overall day-to-day -day running of the society is run by uh, sentient computers oh. uh, which are uh, who, which are entirely benevolent uh -huh. uh, and the entire society is just given over the all of that side to just letting these super powerful artificial intelligences run everything uh they're post scarcity so nobody's wanting for anything so it's it's a very very socialist environment because of that and the only kind of real rule they have is that uh, well, they don't appear to have any law. It seems to be an anarchist post-scarcity society where your reputation is important. And if you do something bad, you'll lose, you know, reputation and people won't want to be around you. And because everybody wants to be liked by everybody else, everybody just behaves really nicely. And it has generated this whole kind of society of artists and people who kind of want to go and try things out. Uh, they're very interesting books. It's a series called The Culture Novels. The Culture Novels? Yeah, by Ian M. Banks. And I'll email you a link afterwards. I'll email you uh, some details. I appreciate of them. that. Yes. Yeah, because they are really good novels. And, you know, he writes these... A lot of his stories are about how... About the kind of conflict that arises when this almost utopian society which has got almost godlike powers because of this, you know, it has these super massive starships that are entirely sentient and all this kind of stuff and are treated as members of the society. Uh, it's all about how other societies rub up against them when they come mm -hmm. in contact with them. But the whole notion that if something is sentient in that society, it is treated as an equal member of that society, whether it's a, a you know, a small computer sitting on your desk or a starship that's 200 kilometers long. All these things are treated as individuals within the society with equal rights. And I think oh. that, to my mind, is uh, that to me, to me would be the perfect society because you could do what you want without harming anybody and you could trust that nobody wanted to harm you. And oh. as you say, you'd have that uh, upper level of things looking after the day-to-day -day running of it. Uh, 
but I wonder how people would deal with that. You know, would we all, would there be a bit of a time of uh, readjustment if we faced that? Yes, especially if you grew up under a certain uh, family uh, discipline and, and you want to emulate it, you, you want to have children, you want to have a job, you want to have a car, you want to have a house, and uh, and you want to have your two point, two and a half point children. Mm -hmm. So if you want to give up the, the, the old vision uh, of struggling and... Uh, and be in, if it be in bliss. Yeah. <laughs> in the spiritual side of things, if I can call it a side, mm -hmm. but a spiritual understanding that permeates, uh, I guess, all of the um, disciplines I've explored, is that our basic core nature is bliss. Mm -hmm. This bliss is independent of happiness or sadness. It's it's a s state of continuous omnipresent equilibrium and it's something you don't associate with human existence but uh, the spiritual teachings is that the human body comes and goes but underlying it and permeating it is the true self which in itself is bliss mm -hmm. and is when this blissful self identifies with the body then it tries to live the agenda of the body and that's when it runs into uh, resistance and it runs into the experience of relativity and losing things and things die and things come to you and this fluctuation and this uh, this uh, to and fro this relativity is what gets in the way of a sustained experiencing the underlying blissful nature mm -hmm. um, see why did I go there it's that when you think of if we were just to think of ourselves as individual human beings in a society, each one reaching for their level of happiness and sustaining it, that uh, happiness could come and could go. But if each individual were to dive beneath the surface of the appearance of being separate individuals mm -hmm. and reconnect with the uh, underlying current that... Uh, whether we call it the I am, whether we call it the God presence, or we call it Allah, or call it the, uh, the Great Spirit, we call it that underlying common denominator. Mm -hmm. And if we could feel it, feel it, feel its eternity, feel its universal presence, uh, I believe each individual could import a sense of bliss that could translate into a rather unique form of happiness, well-being, and equilibrium into their life. Uh, in the case of performing artists, you would find it the artists importing uh, inspirations for rather sublime and euphoric kinds of designs and creative expressions. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely. I think uh, I had a thought about that as we were talking. Uh, I think, well, actually, yes. Uh, I think, for, to me, one of the things that's uh, really kind of changed my perspective about the world is that... Uh, reading up about things like evolutionary biology and realizing that all humans are almost identical genetically uh you know we're, we're so close to each other you know if you were to take yeah. us and, you know it's we both have two nostrils <laughs> absolutely yeah absolutely but if you take it right down to the level of just the dna the dna of of, of my dna and your dna is practically identical and it's the same for everybody which means that our subjective experience of reality is pretty much the same for everybody and i think that's an important thing that people miss i think i think we all kind of feel that we're kind of locked in our heads and the universe is made up of two parts the part that's inside us and everything else and i think if we kind of realize that we're all broadly the same uh, I think that would be a positive thing for people. And I think, I think it's a difficult thing for people to take on. But I think it's a, a useful thing to realise. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it kind of fits a little bit with what you were saying about the, the underlying spirit and things. And from my take on it is that is what I would define as the underlying spirit, the kind of realisation of similarity and kinship. Yes, I'm getting in touch with that. Mm, yeah. Because I think, I think you know, if you, if you realise that everybody else is the same as you and has the same fears and the same, you know, the same aut autonomic responses to things, you know, their body's going to res respond in the same way. 
uh, I think people would be less likely to kill each other or steal they from would, each other. They would, and they would probably be in a better position to love and share meaningful expression experiences with one yes, another. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's I think that's a positive thing. And I think on a positive note, that's a good place to draw things to a close. But before we do, uh, tell me, where would people go to find out more information about your work? Okay. Um, one would be go to my... Uh, you could go to uh, a, a video that's on the air. Maybe you saw it already. Uh, is that the one on... Uh, Vimeo? Yeah, on Vimeo, yes. Oh, you saw that one? Yeah, I posted okay. a link to that. So, so online, so, because you've got a and, website as well, haven't you? Yes, I do. And mm -hmm. that is http mm -hmm. uh, colon slash slash laraji dot blog spot. Fantastic. And I will put a link to this in the uh, the details of the, the podcast when it comes out. Uh, uh, Blogspot.com. Yeah. Is. And I'll put the a link to the video as well, because there's the little video of uh, kind of introduction to you, isn't it? A little 12-minute film, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I was watching earlier. Uh, there's also a very good article in The Wire this month, uh, and I'm getting the feeling that there's going to be a lot of people talking about you in the near future. Uh as this sudden explosion of, of fresh interest takes hold. Yes. I did go on uh, your website, and I saw you quite a few videos there. Yeah. Uh, that, that, and some are an hour long, and you've been doing quite a bit of work. Oh, I do a lot. I do more than one podcast. See, I do another one that's about uh, – well, it started out as, as a kind of atheism uh, podcast, and it's kind of developed into other things. But the uh, – the future library stuff, yeah, I've done quite a lot over the last uh, couple of years now, and it's started to really wow, pick up. So, congratulations. You know, well, you know, I try. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Uh, but it's it's an absolute pleasure being able to speak to people like yourself. You know, I think thank you, Alex. You know, it's great, and I'm really hoping that a, a new generation will come to your music and will go, "This is amazing stuff." Uh, okay. By the way, how close do you live to London? About a uh, hundred miles. Okay. All right, I keep that in mind. I'm due to do some concerts there in uh, the next year. All right, okay. Well, my wife and I will try and get down to see you then, because it's not too hot, too difficult for us to travel down there. So okay, yeah. So that answers the question I was going to ask: is you know, when are you coming to play in the UK? And you've there's just something being questions. planned now out of Warp. Warp Records is planning. Fantastic. Something. I don't know where it will be, but it... well, if you get a chance to play anywhere else, uh, I live in Birmingham, so. Oh. Just, okay. Just up the road. So, yeah, do a little tour. Come and play the, the whole of the UK. People will come in here. Thank it's you good. very much. Okay, well, thank you ever so much for talking to me. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, I recommend all the listeners go out and listen to stuff. I will put uh, information in the uh, web page that this is on. And it's been a pleasure speaking to you. So thank you very much. Beautiful evening to you. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Future Library is brought to you by uh, PetPiranha.com, where you can go and find out various things about people who we've talked about and various people who haven't been on the podcast yet, but might be in the future. If you want to follow us on Twitter, it's uh, twitter.com forward slash Future Library 1, so that's Future Library with a number 1, uh, and you can email me at alexbottom at gmail.com, and don't forget to subscribe via iTunes, just search for Future Library there. Uh, that's it, thanks. Thank you.